Yeah, there are hundreds of people who help bring your favorite concert, sporting event, or award show together. And the prerequisite was always getting together in a room and collaborating, something that's been off the table for quite a while now. Well, both New York City and Los Angeles have now opened up, dramatically removing restrictions that were imposed on us to try and get the COVID-19 pandemic under control. You know, we've talked before on this podcast about how people had to rise to the challenge of being isolated and collaborative at the same time during these interesting days. And my guest this week, an Emmy Award-winning lighting director, found ways to work with teams around the world in a coordinated effort that worked out to be almost the same as being together in the same room using technology. Amazing some of the things that we've figured out over the course of the last year. You know, getting back together with people outside my bubble has been a little daunting, but the human contact is oh so satisfying. And as the new normal begins to take its shape, I hope you've all taken advantage of those vaccines so you can safely rejoin the world again and not have to worry about the risks. Mike Appel is a multiple Emmy Award winning lighting designer and director, working on projects such as the Kids' Choice Awards for Nickelodeon, Unplugged and the Video Music Awards for MTV, the BET Awards, NBC's Christmas and Rockefeller Center, and Democracy Plaza for Election Nights, VH1 Storytellers, and the iHeartRadio Festival, amongst many other shows. He's lit performances at the White House and the broadcast of the NBA Draft. He's been nominated for five Emmy Awards, and he is the winner of three. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, he now lives in South Florida with his wife, Gwen, and his two kids, both world-class ice skaters on their way to Olympic gold. My guest today is Mike Appel. Mike, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. So why don't you tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? I am a lighting designer, lighting director, and lighting programmer. Um, most of my work is in uh, broadcast television and uh, live events, uh, big you know corporate events and um, uh, award shows that that sort of thing. Uh, a little bit, I do a little bit of everything when it comes to lighting, but uh, that that's the main focus of what I do. Cool. Uh, what shows have you done that people might have seen? Um, uh, VMAs, uh, Kids Choice Awards, the iHeartRadio Festival. Um, Back in October, uh, we did the uh, worked on the League of Legends World Championships, so we flew to wow. China and did that. So that was something, and um, uh, things like that. I'm in uh, Seattle right now, um, preparing to do a uh, launch for a tech company out here. That's uh, an NDA project, so can't say what okay. it is, but uh, it'll be revealed to the world shortly. <laughs> no worries. Um, what's your favorite part about what you do? Uh, the variation, I think, and the, just being able to do something different all the time. The shows are the shows that I, I'm fortunate to work on are incredibly challenging, from lots of different you know, in lots of different ways, from technical standpoint, artistic standpoint, sometimes budgetary standpoint, and trying to uh, come up with solutions for those problems that are, are you know they're always there, but having a different set of challenges week to week, month to month, job over job, even the same project year over year with new sets, new lighting rigs, you know, new technology developing yeah. all the time. That's the, that's the most fun. And, you know, the traveling is nice too. Yeah. I'll bet you yeah. do a lot of traveling if you're doing uh, award shows I, all over. Yeah. That's that. I, yeah. We, um, I'm trying to think, uh, well, before COVID I, uh, was on the road about nine months of the year. Wow. Uh, when COVID hit, obviously that all changed and we went nowhere. But yeah. um, uh, but things have picked up since uh, since February of 2021. Uh, you know, things have really started to uh, to move and people want to produce shows and people want to be together. And, you know, with people getting yeah. vaccinated, it's it's been a that's been a big help for the business. So uh, how long have you been doing this? Uh, well, I started in doing lighting in theater when I was in high school. I wasn't okay. actually doing it in high school. I was, I got a, a position in an orchestra, community orchestra playing bass. Nice. And, and the, the, the 
rehearsals were all in a uh, roadhouse. So eventually I got a job setting up the chairs and stands. And the guy who was in charge of the roadhouse was like, hey, kid, you want to unload a truck? I'm like, sure. <laughs> so next thing you know, I'm loading, unloading scenery. And do, I did that a few times, started pushing lights around and sets around and realized I enjoyed the lighting side of it and started hanging out with the lighting guys. And that's been my only job ever since I'm 16 years old. Did you uh, go for any formal training in it? Or did you just yeah, I went, um, no, well, I, you pick up a lot on, on site, but, uh, yeah. uh I went, I, I went to Brooklyn college. I, uh, okay. I have a, a BFA, uh, in, uh, theatrical design from Brooklyn college. And then, nice. um, yeah. And then, you know, once I, I left school, um, I just started working. I was working okay. all through college as well. You know, living in New York, uh, you yeah. had a lot of opportunities to do off, off Broadway theater, off Broadway, you know, just kind of whatever was happening. So okay. Be a part of it. That's cool. What's the difference between? This is a big question. So, what is the major difference between lighting, say, a theatrical, you know, a theater show, and lighting a television show? Well, when you're lighting a theatrical production that's meant to be seen by the you know by the audience, is always you now these days is usually a video complement of every show. But yeah. you, if there isn't, you're you're directing the audience to look where you're lighting. You control what is seen at any point. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you're, the levels you use are directly related to what a, a viewer in the audience is, will respond to in terms of you know color and uh, intensity, all that, and where the light is on stage, where the light is in the environment. That's all specific to, th to a theatrical presentation where you, you're driving that experience. In broadcast, the camera controls, the director controls what people see at home. And, okay. it's your, it, and you're responsible for making sure that those images have information in them and that information is that the people are the right color temperature and that the yeah. backgrounds are the right value compared to the people in the foreground and you want to make sure that the pictures are interesting and that they have a composition but when you're doing a multi-cam performance multi-cam shoot you have to be covered from multiple angles so it it, it it's a lot of craft when it, when you get down to the broadcast side of it there's a lot of craft to how it's done theatrical too. There's a lot of craft to it, but then yeah. you try and work the art in around that craft so that you come up with a, with a, a quality product. But really what, what, what I should say is that the main difference between the two to get to the root of your question is that in theater, the lighting designer controls where people look and in television, you do not do that. You, you are, you need to light the scene so that the camera has something to look at. Got it. Uh, have you ever done any film? I did in early in the early two thousands. I did a bunch. I did a bunch of film. I was uh, I worked on a movie with um, Drew Barrymore and Hugh Grant called Music and Lyrics. Okay, uh, where we shot a big uh, Britney Spears style concert performance. It was supposed to be at Madison Square Garden. In the movie we actually shot it at Nassau Coliseum, out on okay. out on Rhode Island. So I did, worked on that. I also worked on a uh, movie with Jennifer Lopez and Mark Anthony that we shot in New York. Uh, period, like period scenes at um, Webster Hall okay. and then went to Puerto Rico and shot uh, big concert sequences, also supposed to be at Madison Square Garden, but we were in a small arena in Bayamon, Puerto Rico. <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, yeah, you know, but it, the, the rhythm of doing features versus what I was used to with live events is very, very different. Yeah. Um, the body rhythm of like, you know, doing a live show, having that rush of, you know, the exhilaration of doing it live and then it being done and wow, that was great. And you walk yeah. away in film. You, there's no payoff like that. Yeah. It's like you shoot yeah. it, stop, reset, shoot it again, stop, yep. reset, shoot it again and again yep. and again and again. And then you go home and you don't know like, well, all right, so was that good? I guess yep. they were happy with it. Yep. You know, it's a yeah. very different rhythm. It took me a while to get used to it. I don't think I ever loved it. As yeah. if I did, I probably would have stayed in, stayed working in, in film, I had a, an offer. Well, I, the, the crews that I was I was working with had offered to help um, usher me into their world a little bit more than I already was. I was kind of coming as a specialist, and I wasn't really part of their their circle. And okay. uh, they had invited me to be part of it, but it just wasn't. It just didn't feel right for me. It just didn't have the right rhythm. I understand exactly what you're talking about as an actor, 
the difference between performing on stage where number one, you don't get a second shot at it, right? You have to know everything you need to know before you go out. Um, and you get that instant rush back from the audience, that instant response. Um, whereas when you're doing film, it's okay, reset, do it again. You know, uh, it's, I've always thought it's funny because if an audience, uh, actually thought about what goes into making a movie, um, the whole glamour idea behind Hollywood would very, very quickly disappear from their minds, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, nobody's yeah. thinking about the fact that it takes, you know, 90 days to shoot two hours of film. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. And that and that the conversation that the two actors are having happens multiple times and the performance is really only one sided because you're doing single camera. Yeah. You know, so it's yep. like, yeah, you're, you're the back of you see the back of somebody's head, but you're not seeing their face right now. You, they had to yep. do that again and be relit and the whole, you know, yeah, it's very. Yep. yep. I did. I did a little bit of uh, three camera TV sitcom kind of stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah. Where they put a real audience in front of you as well. And it's yeah. a totally different kind of experience because right. it's very much more like being on stage and, and uh, performing live. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. My first, my first job in television was multi-camera sitcom. So yeah. yeah that what was, show, uh, can you say? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was uh, Cosby on CBS. I got a, okay. I got a job. It's funny. I was working at Lincoln center and a friend of mine, you know, in the Clark studio theater, which was their educational wing. Okay. And I was, a friend of mine had gotten a job as the uh, head carpenter over at uh, at Cosby, and he he called. Didn't me Cosby up. shoot in Brooklyn back in yeah, those days? That, that no, that was the original Cosby show. The one that okay. I worked on was the one that the follow up he did for CBS. The the original Cosby show was on TV when I was in junior high school. Okay, right? like that was like yeah. So he did a, a follow up with Felicia Rashad. Madeline Kahn was in it. Dougie Doug was in, and that that ver that incarnation of the show. And I wound up getting a job because my friend was the head carpenter. He called me up and said, hey, you want to come in and fill in in the prop department? It's like, yeah, sure. Why not? So I went in, filled in in props a couple times, you know, a couple different days. And they called me up and said, hey, our, one of our regulars is quitting. He's leaving in three days. Do you want his job? Huh. So I had never done props. I'd always done lighting. But I was like, you know what? It's TV and it's guaranteed work from October to May. So yeah. let's try it. Let's see, you know, let's see what happens. So I did a season in props, and then the following season I moved to the lighting to, to the lighting crew, and running the light board, and that was my you know first job doing lighting and television. Very cool. You you've done it all, man. You you yeah. you are definitely a man who's been throughout the industry. That's very cool. Yeah, I started in theater and um, spent a lot of time around classical musicians. My wife is one. Ah. Uh, so yeah, she, you know she's a Juilliard uh, clarin trained clarinetist, uh, but we met in middle school. Okay. And she stayed with the orchestra. I, I bailed on it, you know, pretty yeah. quickly after after high school. But uh, yeah, I did um, opera. Worked at the Santa Fe Opera and uh, and dance. We did a lot of work with you know, Hubbard Street and Palabolus and like all these amazing com companies that we, we would work with. And um, you know, doing those. That's one of the things I missed. That I missed some of that. Those those experiences not doing. Uh, theater anymore but yeah you know it's um it, it's a nice niche where i've fallen into it it's good so of everything you've done do you have a favorite project um one i have a number of favorites but i think my favorite i worked on the um uh, great performances stephen sondheim's 80th birthday with the new york philharmonic shot at lincoln center and that was nice. kind of like the culmination of all the disciplines that i had worked in because you know with the, with the new york phil the classical music and it's you know broadcast obviously so we're there doing a tv show yeah and you know and it's it was very theatrical you know the whole thing was you know very theatrical because we were doing numbers from you know musicals we're doing numbers from sweeney todd and west Side story and all yeah. this stuff and it just felt like the culmination of of all the years of things that i had done i, I probably did that 10 years ago but still it's, it sticks out as a favorite 
not only for the show, because after the show, we went across the street to, to a bar and all of a sudden the cast is filing past us into a back room. And then the, the Lonnie Price, the director shows up and he's like, Hey guys, how you doing? And he bells to this back room. And I'm like, Oh, there's a back room. We're going to the back room. We hadn't been invited to the back room, but we're going to the back room. So we went to the back room, crashed their party. And, you know, we wound up hanging, hanging out with Patty Lapone and Audrey McDonald uh-huh. and Stephen Sondheim and David Hyde Pierce, who had been the, sh- the host of the show. Yeah. And it was just a, well, it was just one of those magical nights of, you know, being around people like that and having conversations about their work and what we did that night and you know, like how everybody was on such a high um, from the show. It was just, yeah, that, that was a great experience. Very cool. Yeah. So your work involves a lot of traveling and all of a sudden COVID came along and pretty much put a stop to that, I'm guessing. Yes, it did. I was um, supposed to be doing a job, uh, a launch for a tech company in Berlin. And um, because Europe had gotten hit with COVID a little bit faster than the U.S., that job, this was back in, uh, I guess, February of 2020, that job was canceled um, early February. We were supposed to be going to Berlin first week of March. Okay. And uh, I was on a job in D.C., uh, at the convention center doing a, uh, a, a corporate, actually it was a, politi- a political event. And um, when that was over on March 3rd, I flew home. I was going to fly from DC to Germany and that didn't happen. So I flew home and that was it, March 3rd. And how long, how, how, how long was it before the next gig came along? Six months. It was six wow. months. Um, the next, the next thing was, um, a corporate stream, like a, a, a show that we normally do for a, a corporate client that is in an arena where they bring all, you know, their, their, their salespeople in and they do a big yeah. 20,000 person, you know, biannual uh, yeah. meeting yeah. Um, that turned into a basic, a, you know, a zoom call, you know, with big screens with yeah. the faces behind and all the, you know, that kind of thing. And we shot that the company's based in North Carolina. So I flew to North Carolina. Actually, I didn't fly. I drove. It was, I was worried. It's funny because I, I had the League of Legends show coming up and I was petrified that I was going to get COVID prior to flying, right? I didn't want it. I, I was so scared that I was going to catch something on this first job that I was going back to. So I didn't yeah. want to get on a plane. So I drove to North Carolina. I drove to I, I drove to North Carolina. I did the show there and then I, I drove home. So that was my first my first time being around that many people since COVID hit, you know, and yeah. it was, um, you know, being, it was great to be back in the theater and back, back working, but it was a little like, when you're standing there, I thought everybody was yeah. too close to me, even when they were 10 feet away. Yeah. So you're too close to me. I was, you know, face shield, you know, double mask, the whole thing, the whole yeah. time I was there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I, I drove home, uh, luckily didn't get sick. Um, did a, um, two weeks of pre pre-production, uh, pre visiting actually for the League of Legends show out of my home office, which was yeah. a very interesting thing. And then um, getting on a plane and flying to China. But the, uh, yeah, it was six months. We were down six months okay. with nothing. And then, but even then, you know, the rest of 2020 was pretty light. After that, that China job was a, a, a big one. And we were, it was about, about a seven week total project between all the work we did in the States, getting yeah. ready to go over there, and then the two weeks of quarantine. And uh, the three and three three and a half weeks on site that we had. So, so you had to fly over there. Then you had to sit in a hotel for two weeks. Right. What was that like? Um, it it was a, a unique experience. It it didn't help <laughs> that the, the view outside my window looked like a prison yard. I felt like I, I was, <laughs> you know, it felt like it, it was a very strange experience. The whole the whole thing was a bit surreal. You know, flying over there. We left from San Francisco. And yeah. the airport was the international terminal was empty. We were the only yeah. our our flight were the only people in there. This was September, end of September, twenty twenty, okay. and um, we uh, we we flew over there. There was thirty of us for the ship from our show on the plane. So yeah. when we landed in China, they had us all get off the plane first. So we get off the plane first, and we're met with people. It looks like the scene from ET where you have everybody in Tyvek suits with goggles and face masks, and they're booties are taped up and their gloves are taped up. And so, you know, there's no air getting in. Yeah. And they're the people that meet us when we get off the plane. The entire airport staff was dressed that way. Everybody was like totally in full hazmat gear. And they take us through 
a series of quest question and answer stations where they ask you where you've been. Have you been in a restaurant? They want to know if you had been in a restaurant in the last 14 days. If yeah. you know where, you know, basically a whole series of questions of where you've been, if you have a cough, all these. So, um, you know, we all, I say, no, no, no. One of the guys that was with us, he says, yes, I have a cough. He didn't have COVID. He just gotten tested. We all did. But yeah. he's like, yeah, I have a cough. And me, all of a sudden he's gone. They whisk him <laughs> off to a government hospital. It's like, where's Will? I don't know. Where's Will? He's like, God, like no luggage, no nothing. Poor guy spent three days in a government hospital with none of his things, no shower, wow. no like nothing until the production could get him out. Um but uh, yeah, so then they take, took us for a COVID test. They jam, it was the most brutal COVID test I'd ever had. They jammed. It was like a brain scrambler. It, it came out. Everybody who had it came out of there crying. It yeah. was really, really painful. And then, you know, um, a few more screening stations until we got to actual customs where they, you know, stamp, looked over our passports and our papers and stamped us through. Once we got through, um, we had a whole series of QR codes to get you from station to station on your phone where we finally got on a bus and the bus took us to our quarantine hotel. When we got off the bus, we were asked to um, close our eyes and put our arms out. And they came at us with a Hudson sprayer of disinfectant and really? sprayed us up and down 360 wow. and our luggage up and down 360 before they would allow us into the lobby of the hotel. Now, when was that this? Was this was in September, September, did you say? September wow. 20. Okay. And at that point, Shanghai had had no locally transmitted cases, I think, for four and a half months. Okay. So they had they had already been like, you know, basically eradicated COVID locally in their yeah. city. So they weren't yeah. taking any. They, they weren't choking around. They didn't want it. <laughs> yeah. So they put us in a hotel room. They don't give you a key because you can't leave. So they oh. unlock the door for you, let you in your room, and then it's like, see you in two weeks. And that was it. They would drop off three meals a day at a, on a little tray table outside the uh, outside your room, and you could open your door to get your meals and put out your trash. And wow. that was and that was it. <laughs> okay, <Yeah. laughs> that's I guess the things you can do in a in a country where you're kind of in a totalitarian state and they can control life a little bit more. Yeah. Very different from uh, from the way we handle things uh, in the U.S. Yeah, very, very different. Well, I heard from people in Shanghai that when all that went down and things got really bad, they just told people to stay home, like lock yourself in your house and don't come out. Whatever food you have for the two weeks that the way you're going to be locked up is good luck to you. That's what you have. And then wow. after two weeks, they started letting people out. So it was like, you know, out for an hour a day to go get stuff. But that first okay. couple of weeks was pretty rough. Wow. You, yeah. Do you do you have a crew of people that work for you? Do you work as an independent with a uh, specific group of people all the time? I work as independent, independent with numerous groups of people, numerous teams. Okay. So, okay. yeah, I mean, I, I work with a lot of the same people and we all kind of rotate around in different circles. So you know, we have um, like there's a, a team that I work with with it's yeah it's just depending upon the project you just grab people with certain skill sets that you need for that project and that's yeah. who you go and do it but really i work with a lot of my friends you know okay. the people who i work with have become my friends and you know you just always want to have a good time at work since we don't have a yeah. human resources department that we have let's say oh we're forced to work with you know whoever and oh man i don't yeah. like that guy he, oh boy we got to work with him today geez i mean of yeah. course you have some of that in any business but you know for the, t the teams that we put together um, that we had can choose, which is most of the time we can choose the people we're working closely with. Um, we we want you want to be with people who um, obviously know what they're doing, but also know how to just you know how to get yeah. along. Absolutely. Yeah. So, does the production company come to you, and then you hire the crew that you work uh, with? Depend, it, depend, it depends on the show. If I'm if I'm programming the show, I get hired on as part of the crew. If I'm okay. designing, if I'm designing the show, I will put the crew together. You know, based I'll put a gaffer. You know, hire a gaffer. Hire uh, you know, a bet, well, usually I'll hire a gaffer and then they'll crew out the rest of the uh, rest of the right. team. So, yep. and I'll hire a programmer, you know, so I'll hire the two key positions, the gaffer and the programmer. And then, then the programmer will usually recommend a second okay. if we need to go big enough to need a second programmer or, or, and the gaffer will put the rest of the crew together. Okay. Um, we just shot something for Disney, um, where it was, came together really last minute and I called my usual uh, people in LA. Luckily, I, I could, my, the programmer I called, she was able to be available and a great friend of mine. Um, 
so she worked with me, but the gaffer that I called wasn't available, but he's like, Oh, I'm working with somebody today. Who's really great. And he, you know, recommended a guy to me who was wonderful. Just the guy who normally does America's got talent. So I'm like, yeah, I figured he'll be okay. okay. Yeah. So cool. It's not like, cool. you know, it's not, it's not like he was recommending somebody who just like, didn't know what they're doing. So yeah. Like, yeah, that'll be fine. And he was awesome. And so we, you know, put this thing together. So last minute and uh, it worked out great. It was just, you know, and that's how that project came together. But everyone's a little bit different. Cool. Every project is a little bit different the way that it gets screwed up. Okay. You said that um, the whole pre-production and pre-visualization that you were doing from home was interesting. Can you talk a little bit about that? So since people, you know, we were still in the time where people didn't want, you know, didn't want to be in the same room together. Um, the show that we were doing in Shanghai is a massive, massive show. It's probably the biggest show that was done in the world in terms of gear and scope uh, last okay. year, because of, you know, just the nature of the, of the year the world had. And um, we uh, were able to, I was able to get a lighting desk at my home office. And um, Tiffany, who was the other programmer on the, on the job, was at a, a previous studio in LA called Early Bird. So okay. the team from Early Bird was servicing this as like the model builder, the virtual model builder for our lighting rig. Yeah. And they also facilitated a link between my office and their office where because the shows were so big that we couldn't run them together. We had to have one set of the one part of the show on my lighting console and another part of the show on her lighting console. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you had to take the feed from my screen of what I was looking at and the feed from her screen and what she was looking at and composite them together into oh. an image of what the whole show would actually look like. And then that got routed to a web portal that allowed the design team, half of which was in China and half of it, which was in another location in Los Angeles, to log in and look at it. And we were also able to link up time code so that Tiffany could fire time code a simply time code track in Los Angeles and it would fight. We did, you know, would delay it in LA a little bit so that it would, when it hit me and then my signal got back to them, it was synced up. So we figured out the millisecond delay and all that of nice. what that link was going to be. So she could fire time code and our, our lighting desks would run in tandem in sync. Yeah, wow. In sync, totally That's amazing. Up. So yeah. is, did that technology exist prior to you doing this or did you invent some of this? Did you um, jury rig well, it? I think, I think the, the, the bits and pieces of it existed. I don't think it was ever done the way we did it. You know, yeah. I, you know, I don't think there was a call. I'd be shocked if there had been a call for what we did yeah. um, in the year, in the time prior to COVID. But um, yeah, the team at early bird did a great job of pulling that together and, and mm -hmm. making all the bits and pieces work. While we were planning this out, a company out of um, Nashville developed a product they call the Bridge, which is a wonderful thing, and it allows uh, pieces of gear, especially used for the lighting business, lighting uh, entertainment industry, to be that need to be usually connected to a switch. Yeah, it allows them to be connected. Basically, the machines think they're connected to each other, but they're actually connected over the internet. Okay. So you can then create a lighting session between two consoles or multiple pieces of gear all over the country, all over the country, all over the world. And it's all linked up via this product called the bridge. But our show was so big, we couldn't utilize it because normally the way we would program a show like that is we all be in the same session and we'd able, be able to grab each other's lights and yeah. oh, I'll work on these lights. I'll work on those lights. Fine. But because yeah. the shows, were so, the show was so big, we didn't have that luxury. We had our boards were totally full with what we were doing. We couldn't share information that way. So do, do do you see yourself continuing to use this technology after the world's reopened fully and everybody can get back together? Or do you think, I think that? So. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think, you know, we were able to using a, a hodgepodge of different uh, technology. We, we use discord a lot to do the video yeah. conferencing and file sharing. Um, so we had, I had discord on my, on my iPad and I had something else running on my, on my laptop. And then I had yeah. the previous computer doing something else. And we, you know, through, through all that, we were able to collaborate and the collaboration was actually, it was very fruitful. It was like, you know, it felt like we were together. It really yeah. did. Yeah. So, um, you know, and we have another one of these coming up. I don't know how we'll wind up doing it, but it's very possible we'll wind up doing it in a similar way. Yeah. If people are if people are spread out all over the country like we like we are or all over the world, yeah, yeah. The business the business has changed. 
Right, production's changed now. You don't have to be in a city with a studio anymore, and you can still be a uh, contributor to the process. So it's kind of cool. Right. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it, it, it's been great working. You know, the working remotely has been happening in my business for a while because we, we, you know, all, all the all the planning that we do, everybody's, you know, where wherever they live. So we're yeah. doing all the planning remotely. We're sharing files on Dropbox or some cloud, other cloud services, you know, sharing renderings and, and um, you know, the things that we do in Previs via, you know, via um, Vimeo or, you know, all yeah. sorts of different ways to share information and share the project before we show up on site. So this is yeah. all just an extension of that. Okay. How'd your family uh, hold up through all of this? They they were okay. I think they were probably sick of seeing me <laughs> after a while. Yeah, I know that. You know, <laughs> my, wife, you know, Gwen, my wife Gwen, she's she's funny. She you know like I, I forget how long into the shutdown this was, but she looks at me and she goes, "Yeah, I didn't think this was going to go very well." <laughs> me being <laughs> home as much, right? Because I'm usually away for nine months out of the year. You know, in little you know not yeah. solid, but you know, week here, week there, two weeks here, a month long here, whatever. Yeah, but it was actually it was actually great. The kids, my both my kids are figure skaters, uh, very high level figure skaters. So for them being off the ice and having the rink shut down was difficult. But we live yeah. in Florida, so things opened up a little bit quicker than they did in other places. So that was good for them. Okay, uh, and um, you know we we all stayed healthy. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I, when gyms opened up in Florida, we joined a gym, and uh, you know we tried to stay healthy. It was like kind of like your relief valve. The yeah. relief valve for us was going to the gym. You okay. know, since we, I, like I had, I'm used to having, you know, deadlines and projects and I had nothing. So, you know, we found a gym that was difficult and getting through those workouts daily was difficult. So that was my goal for the day. Okay. And it worked, it, it worked out, you know, at the end of, uh, after a year of not, uh, not drinking a lot and, uh, trying to eat better and, you know, do some, exercise i wound up losing 50 pounds so that was good for you yeah so that was that was a nice part of the uh the shutdown bad for the wallet good for other things good, nice good for other things my kids yeah. and reconnect with my wife and just like yeah it was that part of it was good but and luckily we stayed healthy so do, does your wife continue to perform professionally no no she she was playing in new york we left we lived in the new york metro area until 2012 Okay. And she was playing in the New York Rep Orchestra until that time, but then we just, we made a it was a financial decision to get out of the New York metro area, and yeah. we moved to Florida. And then um, she played a little bit when we got to Florida, but then our kids got involved in figure skating, and she became you know she's kind of like the team manager, and it takes got that it. it's 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 at the level that they the kids work at work and skate you know where yeah. their level is outrageous. And it takes somebody to manage all that. It's okay. it's a lot of work. So okay. she became the team manager. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. yeah it's, I, I, I can tell you from my daughter's experience, the being a, a musician and being caught in the pandemic was just a nightmare, right? She's yeah. No longer allowed to stand in the same room with somebody and yet you're trying to play music with them. Though I've seen people do some very interesting things with, um, video conferencing and, and putting together performances as well. Yeah. That's, you know, all that's great, but people need to be back together again. I mean, oh. you know, it, it was a, it's a great stop gap. It's a great, you know, it's like, yeah, it's fun to do. It's, it's great if you can try and make it work, but not having that physical connection, not yeah. feeling the bass, not feeling the drums, not feeling like you have to yep. be together. Like yep. all these, the zoom calls and the, the XR shows are wonderful, but they are in a way a little bit soulless. They have, you know, they're, yeah. they, they, they are missing that con- element of connection to an audience that you only get. Yeah. The they're, live. they're an oddity. You know what I mean? It's like right. watching a sideshow a little bit, not to take anything away from the quality mm-hmm. of what you're getting. Oh, no, it just no, it doesn't some feel some right. Gorgeous. Yeah. Some of the, the work that's being done is incredibly tech is incredibly complex technically wonderful, beautiful, beautifully executed. Um, and really some of the things are, you know, can you can get an emotional response from, but 
the broad amount of it. I mean, the mo- most of it, it, you don't, you don't feel that most of it. Yeah. You don't, it takes a very yeah. special project to bring that sort of level of emotion. It's gotta be really spot on yeah. and it has to be execution has to be from the music to the way it's shot, to the way it's lit, to the content that's on the screen. And, you know, and you, as any little glitch in the camera yeah. takes you immediately out of it. You like, yeah. you lo- yep. it breaks the illusion. Yep. So it has to be done perfectly, and if when it's done perfectly, it's 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 great. Like some of the some of the work that's been done on um, America's Got Talent did um, amazing amazing work, XR work. Uh, some of the work that was done in Shanghai that we that um, uh, the guys that worked on League of Legends uh, did yeah. was also amazing for all the prelim play and stuff. It was in- incredibly well done. Yeah. And um, but you know, it takes a yeah. lot to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Things are opening up. People are getting their vaccines. The world is getting better. How do the next six months look for you? Uh, they look pretty good. I mean, it, I, it's been, it's, over you know, the summer, yeah, we have a bunch of shows coming up. Um, I've been doing a, a number of uh, these crazy boxing matches that have been, you know, these pay-per-views that have been happening. Okay. And uh, we have another one, another couple of those coming up, which are exciting. We did the, uh, I worked on the Ben Askren, Jake uh, Paul fight. A few months, uh, maybe it was like a month, a little over a month ago. Okay, and that was that was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, so we have a, a bunch of those coming up. We have uh, yeah, a lot of different projects. A bunch of corporate clients are coming back and doing things, and people are people are making plans to do shows in like really do shows in person. So that's good. Yeah, like a cool. lot, you know, I work on the iHeart Radio Festival, and that's coming back in person in Vegas at the T-Mobile Arena. So that's huge. Nice. You know, you know, being yeah. able to, uh, you know, you're going to do a f- concert with full on, you know. Yeah. We have festive. a, we have a beach uh, concert festival out here in Redondo every year. And um, they're actually planning uh, to have it um, live this year. So that's exciting. It's that's great, great to It's see outdoors, the music. right? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Beach, right? So that's, yeah. that's great. Yep. Cool. That's great. Yeah the, yeah, the show that we're doing, the show that that big show is indoors, um, and you know, with a with the Golden Knights play. But you know, hey, vaccinated, come on in. Yeah, cool. What are you looking forward to the most when when everything is back to whatever the new normal is? Hmm, that's a good question. I haven't thought about it. What I'm not looking forward to the most, I guess, just like not having to wear a mask. You yeah. know, I'm, that I think it would be the best thing. It's like if like, my day didn't involve putting a mask on and off when I walked indoors. Yeah, that would be that would be good. Okay. You know, today today I spent the day. You know, we spent the day working, and the whole day I was in a mask. And you know, by the end of end of the day, just walking outside, you pull that off. You, you yeah, know, breathe that breathe that air. That you know, nice yeah. Seattle. <laughs> Yeah. downtown yeah, which is not that crowded because of you know covid so there's not that many vehicles on the street but still it's like you know just to get that that air in your lungs it's like that's the big thing like no masks yeah. yep okay that's what i'm cool want. yeah is there anything i can plug for you um no <laughs> <laughs> no no nothing at all actually i mean um i'm trying to think what what do i have no i mean um uh, no <laughs> Okay. Uh, not, not really. I'm just, uh, yeah, trying to think what, I mean, we have shows coming. Yeah. Watch the iHeart radio festival. That'll be fun. You okay. know, watch some, you know, that, that's, that's a good one. Cause that's, that's a lot of different music and it's, it's usually live streamed on, um, on, uh, C, the CW website and on YouTube. And then it airs a few weeks after we shoot it and they break it cause it's four and a half hours or to four and a half to five hours of concerts over two nights. So they can't air that okay. all. But, right. but they, they, they usually edit it down to two hours per night and air it in sequence on the CW. Awesome. So cool. you know, you, in the years past, we've had you know everybody from Miley Cyrus to Fleetwood Mac to Motley Crue to Duran Duran to Zac Brown Band, U2, uh, Drake, uh, Usher. It's like it's just a who's who of anybody who's anybody in – you know, country pop rock. It's, it's great. It's, it's cool. a great time. Yeah. We will keep an eye out for it. Listen, yeah. thanks for taking time out. I know you're busy up there in Seattle and uh, yeah. it was great talking to you. It's great talking to you. Thanks for having me on.